Welcome to Kingdom Theology. I hope you're blessed in the Lord today. In this video, we're going to continue to talk about mid-Acts dispensationalism, also known as Pauline dispensationalism. Uh, I'm thinking this is probably going to be the last video. We're just covering the core teachings that are held by those in that movement. There's various teachings that they have, but I wanted to try to focus on the ones that all of them hold to. And so in this video, we want to look at the fact that they teach that there are different gospels, that Peter, James, and John, and Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom, but that Paul preached the gospel of grace. In their system, Paul is supposed to be our apostle. We're supposed to follow his writings as something written for us in our dispensation, but they say that Peter, James, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, all those wrote for the Jews, and they're not directly applicable to us. We can read them just like we read the Old Testament, but it's not our dispensation, so it doesn't really apply to us. And so they also say that this gospel is, that Paul's gospel is distinct from Peter, James, and John. So let's go ahead and look at a couple passages here and compare the gospel that was preached by Peter, in this case, and Paul. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, starting verse 26, 36. This is the day of Pentecost. Of course, Peter has already preached his entire message, talking about Jesus uh, dying, rising again. And now uh, in verse 36, it says, Therefore, his conclusion, Therefore, let all the house of Israel assuredly know that God has made this Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. When they heard this, they were stung in the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God will call. So here in this passage, those in the mid-Acts dispensationalist movement would say that Paul or that Peter was preaching the gospel of the kingdom not the gospel of grace. They would m make much of the fact that he says that they should repent um, and be baptized, whereas those in this hyper-dispensationalist camp, will, most of them will say that we don't need to be baptized in water, or at least to some, some of them will say that. And then the others will say that no, repentance turning away from rebellion and sin was an aspect that was belonged to the gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel of grace. Then the gospel of grace, we need merely believe. So it says here, what should we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now let's look over in Acts chapter 16. This is often uh, appealed to, this is a passage that is often a proof text for those in the free grace movement and definitely also those in the mid-Acts uh, system of theology. Okay, so if we go over, this is going to be whenever Paul was preaching to the Philippian jailer, uh, and actually he had just, the, they had had an earthquake because they were singing songs to the Lord, they were in prison, all the jail cells were open, the Philippian jailer was about to kill himself, and, it's, and said here in verse 28, but Paul shouted, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. He called for lights and rushed in, trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. He then led them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you and your household will be saved. So we see why those that are not clear on the scripture would think that this is two different things. Because here in Acts chapter 2, verse 20, 30, uh, 37, it said, When they heard this, they were stung in the heart and said to Peter, What shall we do? In other words, just like here, what shall we do to be saved? And Peter answered, Repent and be baptized. Two things, repent and be baptized. But here, whenever this man says, What shall I do to be saved? In verse 31, uh, Paul answers, or they answered, so that's uh, Paul and uh, Silas, answered, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household will be saved. And so which is it? Do we believe in the Lord Jesus to be saved or do we repent and be baptized to be saved? So let's take a closer look at this passage and see if it really is saying something different. Now, first of all, let me note that th those that are in the mid axis dispensationalist group are all going to be from the free grace camp, which means they're always going to appeal to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. Let's quickly look over there. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4. It says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried, rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and... Uh, 
and rose again the third day according to the scripture. So they will say, this is the gospel. This is what you must believe. In the free grace uh, sect, they will say that you just believe in these facts of the gospel, that Jesus died and rose again. And they will often appeal to uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 31. See here, it doesn't say about turning away from your sins. It doesn't say about being baptized. It just says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's just through faith. Problem is, if this is all that Paul said, if Paul only said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household will be saved, then he didn't preach the gospel even according to those in the mid-Acts dispensationalist movement and those in the free grace theology. Why? Because he doesn't say about Jesus dying for our sins according to the scriptures and rising again according to the scripture. He just says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household will be saved. So did he preach the gospel or did he not? And most certainly he did. If we go on in verse 32, because this was not all that Paul said. He didn't just say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And then that was it. And then they were saved. No. Verse 32. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his household. So they continued to speak. This was only the beginning, the, the first or the summary of what they said. To believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. So let's note here that in Paul's or in Peter's message, Back in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, the conclusion was, Therefore let all the house of Israel assuredly know that God has made this Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. What do we see here in, in Acts chapter 16? It says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, This Jesus, whom you crucified, has been made Lord and Christ. So here he's talking about Jesus being the Christ, the anointed one, the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. He's talking about him being the Lord, the Lord of heaven and earth. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus said in the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28. So here he's talking about the same one, Jesus, who has been made Lord and Christ. So believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. So we know that he was at least preaching that. But verse 32, and they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his household. So what did pr Paul preach everywhere? When he would go to proclaim, did, did he only say to believe or did he talk, talk to people that they should repent, that they should turn away from the rebellion of God and that they should do works worthy of repentance? Did Paul preach that everywhere he went? Of course he did. We read that from him in Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26, starting in verse 19. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those at Damascus, then at Jerusalem, so where he was, then at Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, all the Jews, and also to the Gentiles, this is what he preached to Jew and the Gentile, that they should repent and turn to God and do works proving their repentance. Okay? So this is what Paul preached everywhere. This is the, the message that he had for everyone, Jew and Gentile, everywhere he preached. So when we read in Acts chapter 16, Verse 32, and they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his household. We know that he didn't just say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but he also said, repent towards God. Turn back to God and do work, do uh, works worthy of repentance. So we know that was part of Paul's message. But how can we be sure, besides the fact that Paul says that that's what he preached everywhere from Damascus all the way to all the Gentiles, besides the fact that he said that, we can read on because it says in verse 33, in that hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds, and immediately he and his entire household were baptized. Then he brought them up to his household and set food before them, and he rejoiced with his entire household, believing in God. So he and his household believed in God, and because they believed in God, they were baptized. They were baptized into Jesus Christ. They went into the water. They came out of the water. They died with Jesus in baptism and they rose again. This is how we know that Paul preached the gospel of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 through 4, that Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture and that he rose again according to the scripture. To mention to this Philippian jailer that Jesus is the Lord and the Christ, he would have to mention the Old Testament scriptures, that Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophesy. So in that night, he was speaking many things to them talking about uh, what he would talk about, for example, in Acts chapter 17, where he talks about all the nations have gone their own way, but now God has sent a Savior, commands all men everywhere to repent, to turn away from idolatry. And so he would have been speaking that to this Philippian jailer that night. That's what him and Paul, Paul and Silas would have been speaking to them. And then he would have called them to be baptized. So in baptism, there's a couple of things that are taking place. One, 
we're proclaiming our faith that we believe that Jesus died, that's why we go in the water, and that he rose again, that's why we come out of the water. But we're also proclaiming that we are turning away from our rebellion, we are dying to sin with Jesus, this is what it says in, in Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 4, that we die to sin with him and that we raise to a new life in Jesus Christ. So in baptism, we're both showing that we are repenting, turning away from sin to God, and that we are believing that Jesus died and rose again according to to the scriptures. This is what is being preached. So here in Acts chapter 16, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household will be saved. How do I believe? Well, you need to turn away from, uh, you need to repent and turn back to God and do fruit, uh, do works worthy of repentance. And you need to be baptized, submitting to baptizing, uh, proclaiming that you believe that Jesus died and rose again so that you can live a new life with him. That's what they proclaimed, that's what they did, that's how they responded. The same way that they responded in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Did he mention belief here? Yes, because to be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ means you believe in Jesus. You're going into baptism believing that he died and that he rose again. That was the message that they were preaching. That's why uh, baptism is such a strong a sign of the gospel because it talks about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it shows that we are sharing and partaking in that. So the, the gospel that was preached by Paul in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, is the same one that was preached by Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. So Peter and Paul were preaching the same gospel. Let's look over again at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Starting in verse 1, now this is going to be a passage that is going to be on every uh, mid acts Dispensationalist and Free Gracers Twitter bio. It's going to be up there. It starts off in verse 1. Now, brothers, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which you have received and in which you stand. So they have, Paul preached this gospel, a particular gospel. He's going to give us the details later. He preached this gospel and they believed it and they were standing in it. And it says, through it you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached to you unless you have believed in vain. So as long as they continue to stand in it, they will be saved through the gospel. But here's the, the key. Verse 3 and 4. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. What is this? This is, I'll go ahead and put a video link up here to a video that we already did on talking about the difference between prophecy and mystery. That, that mystery is just understanding what the Old Testament prophecies were about and seeing the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. So here what Paul is saying in verse 3 is this is the mystery of the gospel. This is the mystery that was prophesied in the Old Testament but was not understood by those who read it in the Old Testament, not even by the prophets who longed to understand what they were prophesying about. But it was told them that they were prophesying for us upon whom the ends of the age have come. And it's in this age, in this dispensation, whenever the gospel was revealed from Jesus Christ to his apostles, including the apostle Paul. We see that in Luke chapter 24, also in uh, Ephesians chapter 3. So for... For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I received, this mystery, how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose the third day according to the scriptures. Okay, but it goes on and says, and was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve. So he's mentioning others. He's going to mention Peter and then the, all the twelve. Okay, that, that would be uh, minus Judas and added, uh, I can't remember the, the, the one that they added in Acts chapter 1. Verse 6. Then he was seen by over 500 brothers at once, and whom the greater part remained to this present time, though some have passed away. Then he was seen by James, and then by all the apostles. So we have the 12, including Peter. Then we have James. Then we have all the apostles. Last of all, he was seen by me also as one born at the wrong time. So here, he's putting himself in the lowest category. He was the last to see Christ. And then he goes on in verse 9 and says, For I am the least of the apostles. And am not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the grace of God. And we saw in 1 Timothy chapter 1 that, that God uses uh, 
Paul, as an example of his patience and grace, that even though he was a persecutor, God has now shown his patience. And so in Paul, we see an example of the mercy of God so that we who believe in Christ can be encouraged. Because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. I labored more abundantly than all of them. All of who? When it says all of them, who is it speaking about? It's talking about Cephas, talking about James, talking about... uh, All the the apostles talking about the 12. This is what he's talking about. This is the context of what he's saying. He's saying, this message that I preached to you, that Jesus died and rose again according to the scripture and then was seen by all these men, Cephas, uh, James, all these others, okay? Then it says this, verse 11, therefore, whether it was I or they, okay, who is the I? I is going to be Paul. Paul is the one that he's talking in the first person. Or they. Who is they referring to? It's referring to the people he just mentioned. Cephas, the twelve, James, all the apostles, and himself. Whether it was I or they, so we preach. So we preach. In other words, so we preach what? So we preach the message that was in verse 3 and 4. The gospel. That Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture and rose again according to the scripture. This is what Peter preached. This is what... uh, uh, James preached, this is what John preached, this is what they all preached. All the twelve, all the apostles preached this same message. Whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. You believe this gospel that I preached to you and it's the same message that's preached by Peter, James, John, all the apostles. This is a very clear testament of scripture. Now, Those in the mid-Acts Dispensationalists and the Free Grace Movement might not want to read all the way through. Maybe they want to stop in verse 4. But we want to read all the way through and get the context and understand that Paul's gospel was the same gospel. That 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4 is the same message that was preached by uh, Peter, James, John, all the others. We see this if we go back to Luke chapter 24. This mystery was revealed to them first. The mystery, the fulfillment, how Jesus fulfilled the scriptures, what God had planned from all ages in himself but was not made known. Though it was prophesied and they didn't understand it, it was a mystery. It was hidden in the Old Testament until God revealed it to his holy apostles and prophets. And we see the first hit of him doing this here in Luke chapter 24, verse 44. Then he, he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. So, just as Jesus said in John chapter 5, the scriptures were written about him. He goes on, verse 45, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Up to this point, they didn't understand. Even when Jesus told them he was going to die and rise again, they didn't get it. Even after he rose again, they're still totally confused. But here, he opens their mind to understand the scriptures. And what do the scriptures teach? Verse 46, He said to them, Thus it is written, and accordingly it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. So, what did he show them? He showed them that according to the scriptures, Jesus died for our sins. According to the scriptures, that he rose again. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. But he goes on in verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Okay, now this means that they were not just had the idea to preach to Jews, though it was difficult for them to think how they were going to break that barrier with all the food laws and all the different things. It was difficult for the, the, uh, the Jewish apostles to think, how am I going to break through this? But they knew that Jesus gave them the command in Matthew chapter 28 to go make disciples of all nations because Jesus Christ is Lord of heaven and earth. So therefore go into all the earth and preach the gospel to every creature. For God so loved the world, not just the Jewish world, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so this was the message that they got. This is what they understood, that Jesus died and that he rose again according to the scriptures. The gospel. The gospel according to uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all about? It's about the fact that God's son, 
became flesh. He dwelt among us. He healed the sick. He cast out demons. He showed that he is the Lord. He went and set up on the mountain and he gave his law. You've heard it said in the law of Moses, but I say to you. And he said, go and teach all nations to obey all that I have commanded you. And so this is the gospel of the kingdom of God, that Jesus Christ was there. He was the king. He is the anointed one, the king. He fulfills the Old Testament scripture. And then how did he come into his kingdom? He was he was killed. He was crucified according to the scriptures. He died, was buried, and he rose again according to the scriptures. This is what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospels, are proclaiming. That's why they're called the gospels. The gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Luke, the gospel of... This is the gospel that Jesus died and rose again. That, and that through him, all nations can receive the forgiveness of sins. Now let's go back to Acts chapter... Two, and let's get it real clear because what we're doing is trying to understand that Paul and Peter and James and John and Jesus didn't have different gospels. There was the same message. It was about Jesus Christ, his kingdom, and his grace. That is what the message of the gospel is all about. And so we're going to go through real quick here. We'll just go briefly. Okay, Acts chapter 2. Paul or Peter is preaching and he says this in verse 25. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I might not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the way of life. You will make me full of joy with your presence. What did he just do? He quoted the scripture that Jesus opened up to him to where he understood that this is talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know that because he explains in verse 29, Brothers, I may speak confidently to you concerning the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us today. This couldn't be about David because he's still dead. Verse 30, But being a prophet, David was a prophet, and what did he prophesy? What did he know and what did he tell us? And knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of his seed according to the flesh he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. Okay? To sit on his throne, to sit on David's throne, the throne of David. So the prophecy was that David was going to have a son, and that son was going to sit on his throne forever and rule over uh, all of Israel and over all of the world. Okay, So this is the prophecy that was given, and that he was going to be risen from the dead. And so whenever the prophet David said this, what was he talking about? Why is Peter mentioning this now? Because... Verse 31, he foresaw this and spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So what's the fulfillment of the prophecy? Jesus rising from the dead and then God raised up this Jesus of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you now see and hear. For David has not ascended to the heavens, yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your foot. Therefore, let all the house of Israel assuredly know that God has made this Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Jesus has fulfilled the scriptures. He is now seated at the right hand of God. Not only is he Lord of all Jerusalem, all of Judea, all of the ends of the earth, but he is Lord of heaven and earth. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. This is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. This is the mystery. In the Old Testament, let's go to Ephesians chapter 1 real quick. We looked at this briefly in another video, but we'll look at it here. What's the mystery? What is the what is the fulfillment of the scriptures that, that God, he gave the the prophecies, but people didn't understand them until the apostles and prophets, until it was revealed to them. What is this mystery? If we go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Christ, which are in heaven and in earth. The fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, the mystery that they did not understand in the Old Testament but now has been revealed to us is that Jesus Christ is Lord not only of Jerusalem. He is Lord of heaven and earth. He has all authority in heaven and earth. He, because he was obedient, even obedient to the point of death on a cross, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every other name. He is seated on the king of the throne of David, but that throne is at the right hand of God, and he rules, and he will be there ruling and reigning with God forever because he is God's son, and all things were created for him and through him. 
So this is the gospel of the kingdom of God, that God's kingdom has come. How has it come? It's come through his son. How has it come through his son? Because his son went to the cross, went into death for us, overcame death, and is now highly exalted and seated at the right hand of God. This is the gospel of the kingdom. This is the gospel of the grace of God because we receive grace and the forgiveness of sins through his death, burial, and resurrection. It's uh, in his intercession for us. This is the, the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's all about him. We need to understand this is one gospel. We can look at it from different aspects about the kingdom. Oh, it's focused on Jesus Christ. We can focus on the fact that the grace that we receive from it, but it's one gospel. And this is what was preached by Peter. And this is what Paul's talking about in Ephesians chapter one, the mystery that's in uh, Ephesians one, verse eight through 10. But now let's go ahead and flip over to Acts chapter eight, because we're going to see throughout the book of Acts that this is the same message that was preached. Acts chapter eight, this is... Um, see here. Okay, Philip going to Samaria. So starting in verse four. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached the Christ to them. Now, is he the first one to preach to the Samaritans? No, we read in John chapter four that Jesus, even though in his earthly ministry, he didn't go much to the Samaritans or to the Jews. He did a little bit. He went to the Samaritans. Why does John write that? Because he wants us to know that in the book of John, if you go through that, we touched on this in another video, but if you go through the book of John, it's all about the fact, the mystery, that the Gentiles were going to be welcomed into the salvation that is in the people of Israel. So we see, verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. When the crowds heard, now why does it say preach Christ to them? Because this is the core of our message. We're preaching Jesus Christ. We're not preaching dispensations. We're not preaching covenants. We're not preaching all kinds of things. We're preaching Jesus Christ. He is our salvation. He is the one seated at the right hand of God and able to save all those that come to him. All those that come to God through him can be saved to the uttermost because he ever lives to make intercession for us. We preach Christ. We follow Christ. This is the center of our faith. This is, this is how we decide who is a brother and who is not. Those that follow Christ, that cling to him, that trust in him, that have a faith that works through love, those are our brothers. Those that worship idols, they are not. Those that uh, have a little bit different doctrine, they can have different doctrine as long as they're following Christ, as long as they're clinging to him and walking with him, not walking in rebellion to the king. If they're walking in a rebellion to the king, they are not our brothers. Jesus said, who are my mother and who are my brother and who are my sister? Those that do the will of God, my, of God are my father in heaven. They are my mother and my sister and my brother. And so this is who our brothers and sisters are, those that follow and cling to Jesus Christ that name his name and not only confess it with their mouths, but with their lives, they trust in him, a trust that works through love. So he went and he preached Christ to them. Verse six, when the crowds heard Philip and saw the miracles which he did, they listened intently for unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy. Verse nine, now a man named Simon was previously in the city practicing sorcery and astonishing the nation, the nation of Samaria saying he was someone great, to whom they all listened to from the least of the greatest. This man is the great power of God. They listened to him because for a long time he had astonished them by his sorceries. But when, but when they believed Philip preaching about, preaching about what? Preaching about Christ. But it says this, but when they believed Philip preaching about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Even Simon himself believed and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed as, the, as he watched the signs and miracles which were done. So what was the message that he preached? He preached Jesus Christ. That's the core of the message that Jesus, as, it, as Peter said, that Jesus, God has made this Jesus both Lord and Christ. So he preached the anointed king, Christ. He preached the anointed Christ, or the anointed king, Jesus. Now, but he also preached the kingdom of God because it's through him, the anointed king, that the kingdom comes. Whenever you say Jesus Christ, you're saying Jesus the King, the anointed King that fulfills the Old Testament prophecies, the anointed one, the son of David that's now seated on the throne of David with all authority in heaven and earth. When you say Jesus Christ, that's what you're saying. When you say the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're talking about the King, you're talking about his kingdom, you're talking about the grace that comes through him, you're talking about all of it. So Peter preached the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Now, if we flip over to Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20 is going to be where those in the mid-Acts are going to try to take us to and say, no, 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 Paul preached different. He didn't preach the kingdom of God. He preached 
the gospel of grace. So they're going to go to verse 24. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. But none of these things deter me, nor do I count my life of value to myself, so that I may joyfully finish my course and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So, let's say, see, he had a different dispensation. He preached a different message. He didn't preach the kingdom of God. He preached the gospel of grace. But if we continue to read the next verse, the gospel of the grace of God is synonymous with verse 25. Now I know that all you among whom I went proclaiming the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Whenever those in the mid-Acts dispensationalist group try to divide the gospel of grace from the gospel of the kingdom, they are doing they are abusing the scripture. Jesus said about marriage, he said that if two are joined together, that if God joins something together into one, that no man should break it asunder. The gospel of Jesus Christ is one gospel. We have one faith, one faith, not many different faiths. We have one faith, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is the gospel of the king, his kingdom, and his grace. It's all joined to one. So Paul did not divide the gospel of the grace of God and the gospel of the kingdom. But he says, I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now I know that all of you among whom I went proclaiming the kingdom of God will see my face no more. The, gospel, the grace of God comes through the king and his kingdom. Now what was the message he preached? We can jump up a little bit before, a few verses before. Verse 20, I did not come, keep from declaring to you what was beneficial to you and teaching you publicly and from house to house, testifying to both Jews and Greeks. So he preached not only to the Greeks, but also to the Jews of repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no way that we can make those two things the same thing. Repentance towards God is turning away from unbelief, turning away from rebellion against God, turning away from living in our own way, as Jesus said, taking, uh, denying ourselves and taking up our cross. We're turning away from rebellion and we're turning back to God. As Paul said in Acts chapter 26, that everywhere he went, he proclaimed repentance to people to turn to God and to do works worthy of repentance. So they are commanded to uh, repentance towards God, to turn back to God and do wor works worthy of repentance and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So we repent towards God and we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what he went around preaching when he preached and proclaimed the gospel of the grace of God. When he proclaimed the kingdom of God, this was what he called people to do. Repent towards God and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope we see that these things are not to be divided. They are all joined together in one. Just because we can take a proof text and find the Acts chapter 16, verse 31 that only says believe and we separate it from everything else around it and then say, see, it's only this. This is what we're supposed to do. Well, what about whenever Paul says in Acts chapter 26 that we're supposed to repent, turn to God and do works worthy of repentance? Are we supposed to throw that out also? Are we supposed to throw out the fact that we're supposed to repent towards God and have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Is baptism nowhere, anywhere in the scripture anymore just because we don't want to look at it? No, it's there. It's joined together. And a man better be very careful when he says, I'm rightfully dividing, when he's actually cutting asunder what God has joined together. We must be very careful. There is one faith, one gospel. Okay, so we must trust in that gospel and we must obey that gospel as Paul says. And I think Thessalonians, he says, those that do not obey the gospel will suffer the wrath of God. Now let's go ahead and continue up to Acts 28. Acts chapter 28. We want to see something very interesting here. We remember that, that Peter preached about Jesus Christ, that he was the Lord and the Christ, uh, and that he was the king prophesied by David. And we see in Acts chapter 8 that, that Philip preached the kingdom of God and the things concerning Jesus Christ. Well, in Acts chapter 28, when Paul is under house arrest, in verse 21, he's talking about the Jews because the Jews heard he had just got to Rome and they heard about him and they wanted to come talk to him and hear what he had to say. Verse 21, they said to him, we have not received any letters from Judea concerning you and none of the brothers that have come have reported or spoken any evil of you. But we think it is proper to hear from you what you think for concerning this sect, we know that it is spoken against everywhere. So the Jews are going to come and speak with Paul. What message is he going to tell them? Verse 23, when they had arranged a day to be with him, many came to him at his residence. From morning until evening, he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God to them, 
persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets. He was speaking out of the law of Moses and the prophets, saying that Jesus is the fulfillment of this. This is the mystery. We didn't know how it was going to come to pass. Now it has come to pass, and God has revealed it to his apostles that this is the mystery. This is the gospel. Jesus is the Christ that was spoken of in the Old Testament. This is, so it says, testified of the kingdom of God and persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses. Some believed what was said, but some did not believe. Being in disagreement with one another, they were dismissed after Paul had said one word. The Holy Spirit accurately spoke to our fathers through Isaiah the prophet. Go to this people and say, you shall certainly hear, but never understand. You shall certainly see, but never perceive. For the heart of this people has grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and they have closed their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will hear it. So we see something very dramatic. Okay, the Jews come, and Jesus preaches the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news of the kingdom of God to them. He proclaims to them out of the scriptures because he said in, in Romans, if we split to Romans chapter 1, a, a page later, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle of God, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the holy scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of the holiness by the resurrection of the dead. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience of faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are called by Jesus Christ. So here, Paul received, he proclaimed to them the kingdom of God, the good news of Jesus Christ from the scriptures, and then he warns them, if they don't listen, then God is going to send his salvation, the salvation he's just been speaking about, the salvation that's in the kingdom of God, the, go the gospel of grace is the gospel of the kingdom. Then it says this, verse 29, when he had said these words, the Jews departed and disputed greatly among themselves. Verse 30, Paul remained two whole years in his own rented house. He welcomed all who came to him. So he's in Rome. Now he's going to welcome not only the Jews. He's already spoken to them. But now he's going to welcome all Jews and Gentiles that want to come and speak with him. What is he going to tell them? Is he going to tell them something different? Now this is a new dispensation. Now we don't preach the gospel of the kingdom anymore. Uh, now we're just going to talk about grace and just believe. Let's see what he says. He welcomed all who came to him boldly and freely preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. The same thing Peter preached in Acts 2, the same thing that Philip preached in Acts chapter 8, the same thing that he preached to the Ephesians in Acts chapter 20, the, the kingdom of God, the gospel of God's grace, Jesus the Christ. He preached to them the same message. There's only one gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ of his kingdom and of his grace. I hope this has been helpful to you and I hope that we can see that those that try to divide the gospel, that try to divide the apostles from one another, that try to divide Paul away from Jesus and the other apostles, that they are doing damage to the scriptures and they are in danger themselves. Those that teach such things do not know what they're speaking about. They are twisting the scriptures and they are in great danger. And I call them to repentance turn back to God and have fruit worthy of repentance. Because the way that if we go and teach these things, we are attacking the body of Christ. We're dividing it, Jew and Gentile. We're dividing the gospel. How dare we do such a thing? We're saying, I follow Paul. And, and, and others are saying, no, I follow Jesus. No, I follow. No, we're dividing the body of Christ. We're causing division and we are in danger because we're walking according to the flesh by having heresies, these false doctrines made up and invented by men in recent history, only 100 or 200 years was this dispensationalist came and this mid-Acts dispensationalist came even later. Dividing the scriptures, dividing all these things, it is very dangerous. Not only heresies, but then dissension. Calling other people, everybody heretics, everybody is reprobate, everybody's unbeliever because they don't believe our charts, because they don't believe our little conspiracy theories and how we connect some proof texts together and take them and rend the scriptures. 
It is a very dangerous thing that these men do. And I call them to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the stronghold that they've made up in their mind. Not this idea that lifts itself up above the knowledge of God. But the living, risen Son of God that's seated at the throne, uh, at the right hand of God. The one that's on King David's throne and rules forever over heaven and earth. That all heaven and earth have been joined together under his authority because he is the King. He is Lord. He is the Christ. He's fulfilled the scriptures. That's the mystery. Jesus is the mystery. The mystery of Jesus. Jesus Christ. And now Jew and Gentile can be joined in him through faith in him, turning away from the rebellion and submitting to him. It says in Titus that Jesus died, that he gave his life to redeem us from lawlessness. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that he died for all so that we would no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again for us. That is what he did. He redeemed us from the power and bondage of sin. He came to set us free so that we could walk with him. We could cling to him. We don't walk in perfection. We cling to the vine. And because of that, the vine dresser prunes us. He disciplines us. He's faithful to us. But then we continue to bear fruit. We grow in the grace and the knowledge of God. As it says in 2 Peter chapter 1, that these, the, the fruit of God abounds in us more and more. And in this way, we will enter into the eternal glory and kingdom of Jesus Christ by growing in him, clinging to him, bearing fruit in him, abiding in him. As Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 10, if you, if you obey my commandments, you will abide in my love. This is not perfection. First John chapter 2, verse 1 says, that we, he says, I write these things to you so that you will not sin, but if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And so we, we're not called to perfection. We're called to walk close to Jesus. When we fall, we go to the throne of grace and we receive mercy. But then in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, it says, But if someone says they know him and does not obey his commandments, he's a liar and the truth is not in him. This is not perfect obedience, but it is obedience. It is not rebellion. We must turn from rebellion and trust in him. And we must not divide the scriptures. We must not divide the apostles. We must not divide Paul and say we're following him instead of following Christ. This is all nonsense. It's all wicked nonsense. And we need to turn away from it and turn back to the plain gospel, the one faith that is for the one body, And we need to trust in Jesus Christ. Hope this has been helpful to you. If it has, go ahead and like and share it. And if you're not subscribed, go ahead and subscribe for more content like this. God bless.